12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Some local school districts having to plan for different sets of rules when schools set to start again this fall. While some districts at the edge of Bear County are offering parents options on what to do when school starts again, a directive from the San Antonio Metro Health District means they can't offer that to everyone. Garrett Berger tells us at least one district is trying to get out from under Metro Health's order. According to a Bernie ISD spokesman, many parents at Van Raub Elementary and Fair Oaks Ranch Elementary want their kids in class when school starts on August 12th. Right now, it's between 66 and 75 percent of those parents have said we want to send our kids back in person. But unlike the other 10 Bernie ISD schools where parents have an option of returning or remote learning, those two schools are in Bear County, where students must stay off campus until after Labor Day though the district hopes there may be a way to get some sort of exemption or waiver. We've had several conversations with both the TEA, the governor's office, and we're working with other school districts around us to try and see if there's a situation where we're able to open up these two schools. Right now, though, Metro Health says there are no exceptions. If a school is in Bear County, its students have to be off campus. And Bernie isn't the only one with split plans. Neighboring Comal ISD and Medina Valley ISD are also giving parents the option between sending kids back or remote learning when school starts on August 25th. Well, except for the ones with students at the five Comal ISD and one Medina Valley ISD campuses inside Bear County. The Kamal ISD superintendent made sure to tell parents in a letter last week he disagreed with the Metro Health Directive. And while a spokesman said today they'd welcome an intercession from some kind of higher authority, otherwise the district feels it's out of their hands at the moment. Over in Shirt Cibolo Universal City ISD, it's not clear yet what they'll do. While its website says Corbett Junior High and Rose Garden Elementary will have to stay closed, it doesn't have a plan yet for its Guadalupe County schools. The district's board will discuss plans for resuming in-person instruction during its meeting tonight. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All this in a Texas lawyer's offering a contrasting opinion to a statement that State Attorney General Ken Paxton made, which involves the fate of thousands of students in our area amid the pandemic. The Attorney General said that religious schools do not have to abide by the guidelines restricting in-person classes and forcing them to do so is a violation of the United States and Texas constitutions and the Texas Freedom of Religion Act. But local attorney Matthew Manning disagrees. He says there are loopholes, especially when it comes to extenuating circumstances. Even in the law that is cited by Mr. Paxton, the Religious Freedom Act, there is a note that says um, governments can impose restrictions as long as they're the least restrictive um, you know, imposition, but I will say that governments do have the ability to put some imposition on religious practice where it is a compelling state interest, and that's clearly what you have here. Manning adds that because of the unprecedented nature of the pandemic, only time can tell the likelihood of litigation that may arise out of these blanket type of mandated decisions. Meantime, this week, elementary students from Edgewood ISD are receiving iPads. We stopped by that distribution happening at Loma Park Elementary, where more than 500 iPads will be given out. Students from Head Start to fifth grade will get those iPads. They'll be used to watch teacher lessons, turn in their assignments, and then connect with classmates. Staff says it's a relief knowing that students will have the tools they need to learn remotely. First of all, I know uh, safety for our, our teachers and staff is, is paramount, so the fact that they get to conduct learning in a safe way for them, but also, again, giving the kiddos what they need to be successful. Instruction in Edgewood ISD will begin on August 17th. The first four weeks of school will be remote learning under the health directive from Metro Health. They do it six. Unlike other mice, these small rodents are actually a breakthrough in helping find a COVID-19 vaccine. Texas Biomed right here in San Antonio helped discover that these mice mimic the human body's reaction to the coronavirus. So Texas Biomed says they can be used to identify vaccines and antiviral drugs. Jesse Degliato says it's an example of what's involved before a safe and effective vaccine is ready for widespread use. My administration reached a historic agreement. With the White House announcement was a big one. The government agrees to pay Pfizer Pharmaceuticals $2 billion for 100 million doses of a COVID-19 vaccine available in December. But first... That requires a whole bunch of information, not just the clinical trials, 
but evidence of how the vaccine works. In both humans and animals, says Texas Biomed's president and CEO. And even then, he says anything's possible, especially during the FDA's final approval process that could be finished late next year or 2022. In fact, we may have better therapies uh, before we have a vaccine. Yet with the president's Operation Warp Speed and its emphasis on a vaccine during a pandemic and election season, if there's political pressure. Those of us who have the opportunity to speak will tell you that we'll push back and the scientific community will continue to push back because at stake are human lives and in public health, number one is to improve human health and to improve the human condition and we won't compromise on that. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. It's not a surprise, but it is a first. For the first time in its 60 year history, Worst Fest will not be happening this year. Organizers say they're canceling the event in New Braunfels because of the coronavirus. The Worst Fest Association making that announcement today, saying they didn't feel like they would be able to provide the Worst Fest experience they're known for during this pandemic. The group was hard at work trying to get ready for this year's Worst Fest after the Market Plots building was destroyed by a fire last year. Worst Fest, the latest in a long list of events that have been called off because of the coronavirus. Organizers say they'll be looking at ways to help the nonprofits that Worst Fest supports. It's the worst news. It really is. All right, Trans Guide outside 410 at Austin Highway, and you can see things moving on pretty smoothly here. Actually, a bit of a backup, which we haven't seen out here for quite some time, but no major traffic troubles to tell you about. Well, new at six, if you're a parent in the COVID-19 area, you already know everything is different. But do you realize that your home needs to change as well? Ursula Perry with the warning that doctors and injury experts are sending about poisonings during this pandemic. Medicine or candy? That is the question. You may know it came out of a vitamin or pill bottle, but not necessarily your child. Um, Those are antihistamines. These are antihistamines right here, this little red thing, but it very much looks like a red hot. The South Texas Poison Helpline has seen, for example, a 47% increase this year in melatonin poisoning calls. Often, it's medicine gummies that can confuse kids, especially if you carry them around in another container. For example, this is a Dots candy versus my daily multivitamin. Well, those gummies, man, they sure look fun and fine. But again, if a child gets into the little baggie, uh, that could be a very dangerous situation. And X lacks chocolates. You get the idea. We leave them out on the counter. We place them in our purse. We place them in a, in a diaper bag to make them more accessible, but could also create a dangerous situation. According to Safe Kids, a coalition of groups working to prevent injury and accidents, every hour a kid goes to the hospital because they got into someone's medicine. And in the COVID era, that's expected to rise significantly, especially in multi-generational homes. If we're not careful and we put the lid on this way so it's easier for us to take off, it's also easy for kids to get into. In other words, take a look around the house. If you see something within reach, lock it up store it away and be mindful that what might be a poison pill could be a child's deadly dessert. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. A new episode of KSAT Explains is now available and this week we're talking coffee coffee culture, actually. There's been an explosion of local coffee shops in San Antonio over the last few years, from cafes to coffee trucks to places that roast their own beans in-house. There's just about something for everyone here locally. But for a lot of coffee lovers we talked to, it's just as much about the experience of coffee as it is the drink itself. So we wanted to know how coffee evolved from a traditional breakfast beverage to an all-out trend these days. And part of this episode features a guy we're all familiar with here at KSAT, former anchor and reporter turned coffee shop creator, Charles Gonzalez. He left the anchor desk to explore the coffee counter a few years back. You could take the same bean from the same farm, process it three different ways, then roast each of those three different ways, and then brew them three different ways. So, you know, you could have from one bean, you could have 27 different types of drinks at the end. And that's, I think, what's what's really interesting about coffee is there's, there's so it's so nuanced. 
Now, Charles was just one of the people we talked to in this episode who was so passionate about coffee. We explore its history, how it's made, and what makes the beverage, the average consumer, rather, like you and I, seek it out. Check out some fascinating personal stories, including from Spurs guard Patty Mills in this week's episode. KSAT explains coffee culture, available now on KSAT.com or the KSAT TV app. It is really exploding in San Antonio. Everywhere you look, it seems there's another option out there. Yeah, a lot of stuff brewing. <laughs> By the way, Charles looked magnificent with that beard, didn't he? Oh, I'm kind of jealous, to be honest. Yeah, I know. I know. That's what happens when you get out of TV. All right, yeah. 97 degrees out there. Another warm one, but I'm hoping the rain chances are still brewing in the Gulf. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a system brewing in the Gulf, and it's going to affect our rain chances into the weekend. Today, back up to 100, actually 101 for the high. And over the past couple of hours, look at this. A few little brief downpours popped up on the south side of town and other parts of South Texas seen it as well, especially the I-37 corridor in the vicinity of there and parts of the hill country as well. Of course, the big focus is Tropical Depression 8, likely to become Tropical Storm Hannah later tonight. This is gonna make landfall along the Texas coastline on Saturday, bringing with it some areas of heavy rainfall and a bit of a breeze. We'll talk more about this coming up. Rosa, this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Today we are reporting 1,078 new cases of COVID-19 uh, in the community today, which brings our total to 34,633. Keep in mind, again, daily case totals are just one thing that we are tracking. You can review more information about where we are on positivity rate, hospital trends, and onset of illness, the epi curve, at covid19.sanantonio.gov. We unfortunately have a new high to report to you in terms of total fatalities today in one 24-hour uh, period. This brings our total to 298. We have 15 new deaths to report. They have, they are uh, seven Hispanic males in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, five Hispanic females in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, two white females in, her, in their 40s and 50s, and one white male in his 60s. Uh, we continue to mourn these lo the loss of these members of our community. We are with their families and friends, and please keep them in your thoughts this evening. Over in our hospitals tonight, we're reporting um, another uh, downward trend in terms of total hospital admissions. We're reporting 1,074 people in the hospital. That's down 39 from yesterday. We are up, set, excuse me, up eight in the ICUs to 437 and uh, down one on ventilators to 287. In terms of capacity, 46% of ventilators are available and 12% 12, 12 of staffed hospital beds are avail available and the hospital system overall remains under severe stress. Uh, those of you who are tracking the total uh, proportion of COVID-19 in our hospitals overall, that is now at 32% of all patients in the hospital attributed to COVID-19. Turn it over now to Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Yeah, th thanks, Mary. At least the uh, numbers are looking good in terms of people in the hospital. One of our high point was 1,267, so we're down about 193, but that could change any day. But the really scary part is how many people we still have on ICU and on, on ventilators. Uh, it's continuing to be a challenge for us, so we all need to do everything we can to be careful. I, I must say we're starting to run in trouble at the jail. Uh, our population has exploded from 2,900 up to 3,665. Of those, about 390 are paper ready for the uh, state prison system. But the fact of the matter that the state is picking up very, very few people. At the same time, the state's not picking up on it. Only one third of people that we did get out on P P PR bonds now, uh, we're only doing one third of it because the governor's order and because some of the mags are being a little bit more restrictive. So what's happening to us um, with, a, with, with only with 47 guards out, 27 civilians out due to COVID, we are running out of room in the jail to separate them. As you know, we got a very uh, good system, testing where they come in, put them in a separate place, keeping the distance that we need to keep, but now going that much higher in population, 
uh, we're beginning to see some problems. As you may recall, early on when we had a population that was very high, uh, we had about 295 cases, but we worked hard, did the testing and bring it down. And by June the 12th, we only had 20 and it stayed low for a very, very long time. Uh, now it's trending back up. Uh, we had 100 the other day, we had 83 yesterday. So we're gonna really have to have some help from the state and um, have to have some help from our judges and uh, trying to still comply with the governor's order, which made it very, very, very difficult. But we're starting to see the trends going in the wrong way uh, for our jail. We were just talking earlier, Dr. Wu, and all of us about um, the, the issue of um, testing and how long, t issue of testing, that's one thing, you know, that's, fairly easy to do. What's been hard for us is to get the results back from labs. I believe with the testing we're doing and the labs we're using, we're getting average about three days. But there's others that are taking seven to 10 days, and that is showing up all across uh, the United States. Uh, I'll give you an example. When you look at the big numbers nationwide, uh, there were 100,000 people being tested in March. Now we're up to 700,000, and these labs are getting about 30,000 every day uh, to do the test. So that is getting backed up in a in a tremendously uh, bad way. Uh, we mentioned to you where we are on hospitals. It's, it's a trouble all across the nation. There's over 59,000 people in the hospital today because of COVID, of which 10,800 are right here in the state of Texas, and we're getting about 66,000 new virus cases a day across the nation. So we are still got a long way to go to solve this. We don't have borders around San Antonio, Texas, or Bear County. People come in, people go out, and so we're affected by whatever else is happening in the nation. So it's been a real, real challenge for us. Uh, while there's some evidence we may be headed in the right way, uh, we still have a long way to go. So like the mayor says, please do what we're asking you to do. The mass, social distance, uh, sanitation, stay away from large crowds. Uh, we still got a ways to go to get out of this. We do, and, and it's no time to let your guard down. And I'll remind you that uh, as we bring you these numbers, these are uh, family, friends, loved ones, neighbors, aunts, uncles, people who we've lost in our community. And we have seen as the cases have gone up, the severity of cases in the hospital has also. And um, we are tracking now the mortality of these cases, particularly in ICU, as well as on ventilators. And one in four of cases who are admitted to the ICU are now deceased in San Antonio. And 40%, uh, more more than 40% of those on ventilators have been uh, or are now deceased. So we want to do everything we can to protect our community. Please do your part. Wear a mask. And if you have recovered from COVID-19, we encourage you to consider donating plasma. You can find out if you are eligible to donate plasma by contacting the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. You can go to southtexasblood.org. Again, wear your mask. Stay home uh, as much as possible, and we can get through this together. As always, you can text Costa Gov to 55000. All right, that wrap, wraps up the daily briefing from the mayor and the county judge on local cases here. Some good news, the hospitalization numbers, that continues to decline. However, slightly, it is still on the downward trend. However, the mayor reported a new high in the number of deaths in a 24-hour period. 15 people have died in the last 24 hours, ranging in the 40s to the 80s age range, uh, bringing now the total of people who have died here in San Antonio to 200 and 98. Yeah, 12% of staffed hospital beds available, 32% of all Patients in the hospital are patients that are there because of COVID-19. Interesting stats. And you heard the county judge talk about the fact that they are worried because they're running out of room at the jail, especially room to be able to separate some of these asymptomatic or people that have COVID. They are running out of room at the jail. They need the state to start taking more of these prisoners that have been cleared for state transfer. Uh, they've been slow if they're doing it at all. Um, and he also talked about his frustration that testing results are taking so long to get back in the midst of this whole thing. And we hope to address that coming up a little bit later in our KSAT Q&A portion. We'll be right back. 
Our San Antonio Spurs with their first scrimmage in the NBA restart this afternoon. Becky Hammond calling the shots against the best team in the NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks. Brooke Lopez with a hot hand for the three as the Bucks take a six-point lead in that first quarter. Now the Spurs trail, but just two with a minute to go in the first quarter. Giannis Antetokounmpo slices his way in, splits the Spurs D right to the hoop. Second quarter now, Spurs ball. How about Derek White with the alley-oop? DeJounte Murray is calling for it and throws it down. He had 13. Spurs trail 39-37. Third quarter, Chris Middleton, a behind-the-back, no-look pass. Giannis is going to come up with the big-time finish, and the Spurs fall to the Bucks 113-92. The Greek Freak with 22. The Spurs led by Lonnie Walker, the fourth, who, by the way, got the start with 14. We've been playing against each other so much. You know, you kind of get a level of comfortability with each other. So it felt great to, you know, finally play against not only, you know, an NBA team, but a great NBA team at that, you know, with the with the Bucks, And it, it felt good to finally play and get a rhythm. It was fun to get out, you know, just run, go up and down. But, you know, it takes time. I mean, uh, you know, lineups could change. They could stay the same. And you build chemistry with experience. So, um, you know, it was fun, though. All right, next up they have Brooklyn, who, by the way, lost in their opener as far as the scrimmage is concerned at 3.30 and Tuesday against Indiana to wrap it up at 3 p.m. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dak Prescott has franchise tag at $31.4 million, reporting the Dallas Cowboys training camp at the team headquarters in Frisco today. This is the day quarterbacks and injured players are due in camp, but will only be going through the COVID-19 protocol before they can begin workouts. That requires two negative tests over the next two days. The deadline, July 15th, has come and gone with no long-term contract extension for Dak, even though the Kansas City Chiefs were able to work out a 10-year extension for $450 million with incentives for Patrick Mahomes in the final two years of his rookie deal amounts to $503 million. Prescott will have another target to throw at this season after the Cowboys reach an agreement with the first round draft pick C.D. Lamb today. The wide receiver out of Oklahoma agreed to a four-year deal worth $14 million, all guaranteed with a five-year option, according to Clarence Hill of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. San Antonio's own Kellen Mond has been named another watch list, this time the Reagan High School product and now senior quarterback for the fight in Texas Aggies has been named to the 2020 Werfel Trophy watch list, known as college football's premier award for community service. Mond and his teammate actually assist the Twin City Mission, which is a nonprofit organization that helps individuals and families in the Brazos Valley who need basic assistance. Mond will also represent Aggie student athletes on athletics on the Texas A&M's new commission on diversity equity and inclusion. Mon is also on the watch list for the Davey O'Brien Award given out each season for the best quarterback in all of college football. Joined San Antonio's Mon on the Whirlpool watch list is Longhorns quarterback Sam Ellinger. That's after he was named a semifinalist for the award last year. The senior and Austin native is extremely active in the community, most recently raising almost $200,000 for charities related to the COVID-19 relief efforts. He's also passed out meals and school materials to the Austin Boys and Girls Club. Ellinger is also on the watch list for the Davey O'Brien Trophy for the best quarterback in college football. Major League Baseball back in the 2019 American League champion Houston Astros will finally batter up the 2020 Major League season tomorrow night when they host the Seattle Mariners. 2019 Cy Young Award winner Justin Verlander will be getting the start for the Strohs against left-hander Marco Gonzalez for the Mariners, marking the beginning of a six-game homestand for the Astros to open up Major League Baseball's reduced 60-game season. The Rangers will also be in action on Friday night as well, hosting the Colorado Rockies at home in their brand-new stadium, unfortunately, with no fans. I was going to say, that's not exactly the way you want to open up a brand new stadium. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. Thanks, Greg. Got it. Our KSAT Q&A coming up next. 1st days are Dr. Ruth days. Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor, joins us live now to answer our questions and your questions as we go through this COVID pandemic. Dr. Bergeron, thank you for joining us. Right off the top, we've been getting a lot of questions from viewers about school. And I know that you've been involved with an organization that's trying to make, you know, make it easy for parents to understand whether it's safe or not for in-person classes, in your opinion. Right, so um, the city has organized the COVID-19 Community Response Coalition that has several working groups, and one of them is focused specifically on school. It's a really robust committee, um, and they have now uh, decided to create a new indicator bar 
for the COVID-19 website. Um, you know, when, when we look at the city's website to understand progress and warning indicators, there's going to be a new indicator bar that has to do with how conditions are relative to the safety of going back to school. It will be color coded. There'll be a red, yellow, green schematic and a variety of parameters will factor into whether it's a red, yellow or green situation, um, things like percent positive tests and the doubling time of disease um, rates in, in the city. Of course, parents looking for any help to try to make that really, really tough decision. I want to ask you about testing. We heard from the county judge earlier in the show that sometimes results are taking seven to 10 days to get back. So I've heard some people argue, well, why get tested at all then? Uh, what's your response to that? So the goal is really that you're going to get a call back within 72 hours that we're aspirationally trying to get it under 48 hours. We're working towards it. Um, some of the de depends on your test site, really, and um, how busy things have been, the availability of reagents. And so I shouldn't I, I wouldn't want the people of San Antonio to think it's always a seven day wait. It's oftentimes much less than that. And it can really be very helpful in sorting out what else is going on with someone's health. So I, it's discouraging, yes, that we have some people having such a long wait to get their results, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful to get it. And ultimately, there are implications, right? There's implications not just for you, the person who's waiting for their test result, but the per people that are around you, your household, and then the people that you've been in contact with. And that affects contact tracing, and, and, and we also need to understand what's going on. So don't give up on it. I wish it was faster, um, but it's not um, an unhelpful thing to get the test, even if there's a long wait. How concerned are you that about us not being able to flatten the curve, so to speak, before Labor Day? Well, um, our models are suggesting that we are going to be coming down off of this high plateau where we're just uh, below our bed capacity. So we are at a very stressed level for the health system overall, but we're plateauing. And it does look like we're going to be starting to come down off of that plateau by the end of the month and continue to step down slowly uh, through the month of August. I would really like to see us get that curve as flat as possible before Labor Day because uh, then we can feel safer about having children go back to school in person. And that is so important for so many reasons, but it needs to be safe. Are there additional restrictions that you'd like to see in place? Well, I would first of all like to see people using their masks correctly, uh, consistently. I would like to people see people demonstrating an understanding of the social distancing. I know that in I've spoken to extended family members, not me personally, but extended family members that have been in airports recently and they see masking, but they don't see people paying attention to the to the social distancing, the six foot distancing. And I, I really do think we should be very minimal with respect to how full businesses are. You know, I, I I don't think it would be out of the question to really roll back the restrictions to a more strict level than we are right now to help facilitate this very important flattening of the curve. I think right now people are looking for any sign of improvement, any indication as to where we're headed. It's it's encouraging to hear you say that towards the end of the month, hopefully we'll be on that decline and then into <laughs> August before Labor Day. Uh, we've talked about hospitalizations being on the decline this week. It's been a small decline, but is that enough of a sign for you to say that we are improving here locally? So we never look at a single day's worth of data, right? But um, the curves that we've been looking at that show the average daily census in the hospital, they are showing us for uh, more than a week now that we're plateaued to slightly down. And that is a, a very important indicator. We know that hospitalization rates cannot be affected by how many tests are being done in the community. So you can't really get misled by them. So it is an important indicator. But here's a big caveat. You know, we saw a big surge and a prolonged plateau that was contributed to by what happened over 4th of July. We're coming up on Labor Day. If we have the same kinds of family get-togethers and barbecues on Labor Day as we did during the 4th of July, 
two weeks later, we're going to see another rise. And we could continue like this in cyclical fashion, kind of like a roller coaster, um, depending on what we do. So we don't have to sit around and just take it and say these things are happening to us and there's nothing we can do about it. It is all directly related to our social behavior. So if we don't want to see it go spiking back up after Labor Day, we have to be very serious about what we're going to do with ourselves um, over Labor Day and in between times. We can all have an impact. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, thank you for your time, and we'll see you tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, this might look like a runaway <laughs> cooler on wheels, but it's actually part of Amazon's growing fleet of delivery robots all to take packages to the doors of customers. It's called the Amazon Scout. It's being put to the test in Washington and California. It's now expanding field testing to Atlanta and Franklin, Tennessee, near Nashville. The Scout goes at walking pace, as you can see. It can avoid all sorts of objects on the sidewalk. Amazon says the fully electric delivery system will help the company meet its goal for net zero carbon efficiency by 2040. That is so bizarre. Just pop the top. Yeah, my, my dog will still bark at it. Yes. <laughs> Look outside with live cam, 97 degrees out there. There are some clouds in this picture, Adam. We're hoping some of those clouds eventually pay off for us. You know, the south side of town picked up a few little downpours, uh, really not much in terms of accumulations, but at least somebody had a little bit of rain today. We topped out at 101 at the airport in San Antonio today after morning low of 78. Keep in mind, the average high is 95. Especially out west of town, 100 degrees. Del Rio, 104. We topped out at 100 Carrizo Springs and 101 in Catula earlier today. We've got the tropical system right now in the Gulf of Mexico. That's going to boost our rain chances for the weekend. We'll talk about that. Give you the details coming up. All right, we're waiting patiently for some good rain. Yeah, I hope it's some good rain anyway. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Just how much rain are we looking at? Well, that's that's the big question here with this system because a little deviation in the track, of course, will cause a significant change in the rainfall forecast. So I'll let you know what we're expecting here in a moment. Let's talk about rainfall and, of course, Tropical Depression 8 in the Gulf of Mexico. Rainfall today, not a whole lot out there. The I-37 corridor and in parts of Edwards County and surrounding areas, a few showers. Those are the rainfall estimates today, but I do want to point out, especially the south side of San Antonio picked up a little bit of rain, a few little downpours. Don't blink or you miss them but a few of them popped up there earlier this afternoon. Tomorrow, it's going to be more of the same, and then we get into the more tropical moisture as we get into the weekend, and that's the kind of moisture you need to really bust you out of a drought and uh, fill up the aquifer. So we had some showers across the state today. Some other parts got some rain, but the main focus and your eye is drawn to the lower right-hand side of your screen, and that's where we have the tropical depression, which is looking much more organized today than it did yesterday. Even just looking at the visible satellite imagery, this thing is coming together as, as a system, and I think it's going to be a tropical storm by later on this evening, uh, if not later on tonight. But I think this will be tropical storm Hannah fairly, fairly uh, quickly here this evening. Good thunderstorms around it. You see a lot of a lot more organization than we did over the past couple of days. So it's coming together and I think it's going to further strengthen as it does move westward toward the Texas coastline. Most likely stay in a tropical storm when it makes it here on Saturday, but there is that off chance. It could be a little bit stronger than that. So let's talk about this in terms of its path and notice we get into Saturday 1 a.m. It's offshore estimated winds peak winds around 60 miles per hour. That would be in a very confined location close to the center of circulation. Okay, so most people would not be seeing winds like that. Then we get into midday Saturday and still about 60 mile per hour winds in a small confined area around the center of it, anywhere from about Matagorda Bay down to Port Mansfield. And that would be landfall of this tropical storm. Then it moves westward and weakens as they always do when they interact with land. But what this is going to do, bottom line, is bring some heavy rainfall to parts of South Texas. The big question is, where's the cutoff going to be for the heaviest rainfall? You look at the computer models, and we love to look at these spaghetti plots, and they're pretty tightly packed here, uh, basically between 
Matagorda Bay and down to Port Mansfield for the landfall of that tropical storm. Now, in terms of rainfall potential, just through Sunday evening, and it could rain beyond Sunday evening, but just through Sunday evening, you see the real bullseye is along the coastline and down in the Rio Grande Valley. The farther north you go of San Antonio, the lesser amounts of rain you can expect. The farther south you are of town, the more rain you can expect. Right now, we're in the zone of about one to two inches of rainfall. This is from uh, basically Saturday all the way through Sunday evening. And then we could add more to it as we get into Sunday night and into Monday. But keep in mind, if that track wobbles just a little bit more than we're anticipating, you just basically slide this, these colors up and down a little bit. Okay, so we'll keep you updated on this map and let you know how much you can expect as we get more information. 97 right now, dew point is 65, so feels like 100. Actually is 100 in New Braunfels, a degree warmer to be exact. Gonzales at 100 and Uvalde now at 97. 78 tomorrow morning, 100 in the afternoon, more of the same tomorrow, a stray few isolated pop up showers, insignificant and then increasing clouds tomorrow evening. And that's going to be some of the blow off clouds from that tropical system. They'll start noticing, especially some of the higher clouds tomorrow evening. And then later Saturday is when we're expecting some of those showers to maybe make it to San Antonio and then periodically through Sunday, um, some intermittent downpours scattered across South Texas from the system. As for winds immediately along the coast, some of those gusts in a few isolated locations about 50 to 60 around here, you'll notice a little breeze. Concerns about flooding though, I'm guessing the farther south you get. Uh, yes, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the farther south you are of San Antonio, yes. Especially closer to the coast in the Rio Grande Valley. Guess what day it is? Therm Thurs. I gave you a little preview there. So Steve asked last week, if it gets really hot, or say the sun is shining on the thermometer, which it should never do, but say it happens, or you leave it in your car, which you should never do, but say it happens. Could it just pop through the top? I have a remedy for that. It's already been accounted for, so take a look at this. Okay, so I fill the thermometer with the liquid, the alcohol, to the appropriate length, then I flip it over and I seal the open end, the end to which the alcohol entered, okay? I seal it over the flame. Not only do I seal it, once it's sealed shut by the glass, I let it continue to warm the air in the end and it expands and balloons out, and that creates a secondary bulb at the top of the thermometer. That secondary bulb is made for overflow in case, in the rare event, the thermometer gets overheated and is too hot. So the answer, Steve, is no. But that's your thermometers. How about just like, you know, some random your average, thermometers? Your nah, average they won't, they won't thermometers. Either. Okay, good. all right. David Horlocker, San Antonio, the winner of this week's homemade thermometer. Okay, this Therm Thurs dedicated to you. It's very informative. Yes. Secondary bulb, Secondary very bulb. important. Yeah. Yes. Don't underestimate it. I'm not kidding. Hey, I won't. Absolutely. From today on, mm -hmm. I will never. never underestimate a secondary bulb. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's I See Why Am I. Worst Fest has been canceled this year. According to their website, the Worst Fest Association of New Braunfels decided not to hold the event because of COVID-19. Randy Rust, 2020 Worst Fest president, said, quote, this will be the first time Worst Fest has canceled a festival in our 60-year history, end quote. A list of nonprofit organizations that benefit the local community and fundraise at Worst Fest can be found at worstfest.com slash support. The Worst Fest Association of New Braunfels is going to be announcing their plans to help support these organizations. Bear County bracing for a surge in children's COVID-19 cases once in-person school returns. Methodist Children's Hospital says they saw a spike in the number of children hospitalized with the virus. At the same time, adults in the community saw a spike. In June and July, the hospital says about 30 kids were hospitalized with COVID. About half of them did not show symptoms. The hospital says they're coming up with a plan as they prepare for another spike once kids go back to in-person school later this year. Another 1.4 
four million Americans filed for unemployment claims last week. This comes as the coronavirus pandemic worsens parts of the country. It also is the last week for the $600 bonus added to state unemployment benefits. According to the Labor Department, roughly 32 million people are receiving unemployment benefits. This morning, people in our community got the chance to pick up some free groceries. The Salvation Army hosting another food distribution, and this time outside of the Peacock Boys and Girls Club. Putting food on the table is a challenge for a lot of families, and so for us to be able to provide some assistance, uh, we just appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that. The Salvation Army says they were prepared to serve around 500 families today. Nothing gets Taylor Swift fans buzzing like new music from the superstar. A new album is dropping tonight called Folklore. Swift says she wrote and recorded the entire album while in isolation, but admits that she had some help from co-writers. She made the surprise announcement on Twitter. She wrote, most of the things I had planned this summer didn't end up happening, but there is something I hadn't planned on that did happen. I think she's probably talking about the album. I think so. Yeah. So it says she'll premiere the music video for Cardigan, one of her new songs tonight. Okay, I think it's at midnight, something like that. On Twitter? Or just like taylorswift.com? I don't know these things. She, she's got the alerts on her phone. No, I know, I I know exactly. <laughs> Come on, Myra, yeah. look it up. Good for you, Myra. All right, here's our rainfall potential through uh, Sunday evening. And keep in mind, it could rain a little bit beyond then, but the point of this is there's going to be a sharp gradient, sharp cutoff this weekend. Most of it's Saturday night into Sunday and the bulk of the moisture south and east of San Antonio, but we could still get some decent showers. All right, thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching. See you on the night.